I'm Guy Wallace, and I'd like to welcome you to my session, Performance, Competence, and Context Analysis at the Learning and Development Conference for 2020. This short introduction of my program will be followed by part one of the four parts. The four parts address how to model ideal performance, part two, how to conduct a gap analysis, part three, how to derive the performance enablers, and part four, how to target potential improvements. Each of these four segments will include a video and optional readings and optional application exercises. And we'll be doing some debriefing sessions throughout the six weeks of the Learning and Development Conference for 2020. As an advanced organizer, this frames the content of this session. Performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And that requires enablers in the performance context. I do not believe in learning for the sake of learning. It's not all about learning. It's all about performance, even in a learning organization. So go for performance. Have a performance orientation. You may be familiar with the basic process model. Here I've oriented it upstream and downstream. First, it's a traditional look of left to right. One thing that I learned from the late Gary Rumler and from his buddy, Dale Brethauer, was to include the receiving system and feedback loops in this visual. The receiving system is simply another process or set of processes. It's really a chain. Each process set is enabled or disabled based on the adequacy of the enablers in their context. I adapted this model from the Ishikawa diagram from Japan in the 1950s to create my particular version. Now, performance competence could have been performance capabilities or other words, but I used the word competence based on the work of Tom Gilbert, the late Tom Gilbert, in his book, 1978, Human Competence. Performance depends on three variables, in my view. One is the process itself. Two, the environmental enablers. And three, the human enablers. Now, one thing I learned from the late Gary Rumler was to give the performer the benefit of the doubt and look elsewhere. Look to the process first, look to the environment enablers second, and then look at the human enablers. Deming also said that 94% of the problems in the workplace are due to the system, which is in control of, by management and not individual contributors. I use the performance model chart, this version, for capturing data and reporting it back out. I've been using a version of this since 1979. It's a derivative of a derivative of a model that was being used by Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert at their organization, Praxis, back in the 1960s and 70s. Let's take a closer look at one performance model chart using this example, which has been adapted from some of the work that I had done as a consultant in the mid-1980s. On the left-hand side is ideal performance, but not blue sky ideal performance, but real performance as accomplished by master performers who have demonstrated that they can actually do the work to these levels. Now there's two kinds of populations out there to make it simple. People who can perform at a level of mastery and others who cannot, the non-master performers. On the right hand side we do a gap analysis of those non-master performers compared to the ideal performance of the master performers on the left. If the scope of the analysis is larger than one or two task sets, I always establish a framework first. I call these areas of performance. These are some of the questions that I use to elicit the data for the areas of performance and the performance model charts. Note that I found it necessary to be able to paraphrase these questions and ask them in a multitude of ways so that a question will eventually resonate with the people that I'm asking. 
and frankly standards don't often exist formally. But if you ask master performers, they know what they're being asked to do both formally and informally. They know what the standards are. And also I adapted Gilbert's DE and DK, etc. to these three. DE, a deficiency in the environmental enablers. That's what the root cause might be attributed to. Or a D DK, a deficiency of knowledge of the performers. Not somebody else's knowledge, not your bosses, not other suppliers, not customers, not anybody else, but to the performers that we're focusing on. And then DI, deficiencies in the individual's attributes and values. Attributes that are physical in nature, psychological in nature, or intellectual in nature. And then there's personal values. Either these are conducive to the requirements from the process, from the performance, or they are not. Let's do a demo. Let me demonstrate establishing areas of performance first to help you get ready for your optional application exercise. So this is your warning. Followed, I will do a performance model chart to help you get ready for that part of your optional application exercise. I start off with a blank piece of paper and I write the title of the job or the process or whatever is the scope of what I'm supposed to be analyzing. And I ask the people assembled, I like to do this using a facilitated group process where I bring in master performers, perhaps other subject matter experts, perhaps supervisors and managers of the target audience, and perhaps even novice performers, depending on the nature of what I'm looking at and who I'll be talking to. And I ask my client and other key stakeholders who I should be getting this information from. So I ask, what's one major chunk of the job? And sometimes I look at the job title itself and say, oh, instructional designer, does that mean you do design? And of course, the answer is yes. So I plug that right in the center of the flip chart that I'm doing, or if I'm doing this virtually on the screen in the center, because I'm going to start asking questions about, well, what do you do before you do this design stuff? If the answer is analysis, then I capture that. And then I ask again, well, what do you do before analysis? Now, if you're following the ADDIE model, that's it. That's where you start. But there's others who might say, oh, actually, we meet with the client. We formulate a project plan, get agreement on all of that, and then we start the analysis. So maybe there's some project planning and kickoff. This reflects my model, my approach to this, my version of ADDIE. And then I would ask, well, what do you do before project planning and kickoff? And they would say, well, that's the start of it, guy. All right, so let's go back to design and say, so now what, what are some of the major things that you do after design? Well, we do development. Then what do you do after development? Well, we pilot test the content before we make it generally available. So what do you do after the pilot session? Well, we do some revisions and then we release it into the system so that it can be accessed or deployed per the design. And then I might ask, well, so what do you do after revision and release? And they might say, well, that's the end of it. Now, one thing I've learned is that don't stop there. Continue to ask the questions, and I've learned to ask it this way. Is there anything, any task set and outputs that you've produced over the past 12 to 24 months that don't fit in one of these boxes that we've captured already? And they might say, well, we support marketing and sales support, internal marketing and sales support, external marketing, sales and support, something like that. This is just an example, right? Okay. Now let's look at the performance model chart itself and this format. So if I say that, okay, we're going to start with analysis, and normally I always start with the first AOP, and in this example I'm not doing that, I'm starting with analysis, because I think it's a little bit easier for everybody to understand. And I always go to the bottom of my chart and write down who are the performers in this sandbox, you know, is there an instructional designer or an instructional systems designer that's doing this analysis all by themselves? Or are there other players in that? And I like to talk through all of those kinds of things to get the people that I'm working with to get their heads wrapped around this one portion. And they might have told me, well, there's actually these other roles involved. And so I capture those. It's a little asking them to do kind of their own advanced organizer about this before we actually jump in. And now I like to start with outputs, but I found that not everybody thinks about outputs. They think about tasks. But in my demonstration here, I'm going to start with that. So I might ask, so what's what's the output of analysis? When, when do you know when you're done? And they might say, well, we, we produce an analysis report. 
And I say, oh, okay. How do you know a good analysis report from a bad one? And they're going to give me the measures off the tops of their heads because of their experience, because they're master performers, of how their work, their output, the analysis report, is actually assessed by whomever their stakeholders are. And then I'd ask them about the tasks. So what are the tasks? Well, we conduct a target audience analysis, they might say. And I say, well, what do you do after that? And we conduct a performance analysis. And so what do you do after that? Well, we uh, analyze what the knowledge and skill requirements are. Okay, so we capture that. And what's after that? Well, we might assess existing content for its reuse potential. These are my words. This is my approach to things here. That's why I'm setting it up this way. Um, and then what do you do? Well, we do, a ta we do an analysis report. We produce that report. Oh, okay, so you're done then, right? So that's all of it. And somebody might say, well, actually, no, we might have to do a project steering team gate review meeting. Again, this is my language. But we may have to go review our analysis report. Just because we've produced one doesn't mean we're done. We're going to have to go make sure that others agree with what we've captured. And so we ask, well, how, do you can, how can you tell a good one from a bad one of those? Simple question, but it's intended to elicit what are the key measures for that particular output. And then we go identify, well, what are the tasks? Now, we can do these tasks at a fairly high level, as I've got them here, or we can get much more granular. And whether you should go high level, macro, or low level, detailed level, micro, depends on well, what's downstream? What are your uses for this? So there are cases where you can keep it high level, and there's other cases where you need to get very granular, very micro with what these tasks are. And then I can begin to, once I've got that established, what are the outputs? What are the task sets per output? Then I can begin to ask, well, what are the various roles and responsibilities? Who's doing this work? And I might capture it this way with a bunch of X's or check marks. It says, well, here's who's involved in doing that performance. Sometimes people are doing it on their own. Sometimes they're doing it in conjunction with other people. And sometimes these X's or check marks aren't sufficient. And we want to know a little bit more about, well, who executes the task? Who gives input to task execution? Who does any review and gives feedback? And who has approval and rejection authority? Now, there's other uh, models that you can use to capture and describe you know, what the various responsibilities are. This is my model, and I've been using this since the early 80s. So that's the end of this. We're ready to begin the wrap up here, but I want to point out to you, here's some of the optional readings that you, I have for you. It's not too much, but uh, it'll give you a little bit greater depth of this. And again, this is all what you might do in preparation for your optional application exercises. In your optional exercise, uh, and details and templates are available in the session handout, which you'll be given, is to identify the areas of performer for a past kid job, maybe a summer job that you had way back in your youth. Uh, and I ask you to start with something like that because those are usually simpler jobs. It's not always true, but, but uh, so that's what the intent is, is to tr tackle something that's relatively simple rather than something that's maybe more complex like your current job. And I would like you to complete the left-hand side of the performance model chart for at least three of the areas of performance that you've captured regarding your kid job from back in the day. So that's a wrap for part one, where our focus was on capturing the performance competence specifics. Part one logically leads to part two. We will be conducting a gap analysis against the ideal, but not blue sky ideal, but the real performance of master performers. And I hope to see you later in part two. Cheers. I'm Guy Wallace and welcome to part two of my session, Performance Competence and Context Analysis at the Learning and Development Conference for 2020. Part two will focus on conducting a gap analysis against the ideal but real performance captured on the performance model chart as we covered in part one. 
But first, the big picture. Performance competence and performance context. Performance competence is the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. And that's enabled by the environment and human enablers in the context. It's not all about learning, but it is all about performance, even in a learning organization. Begin with that end in mind. Go for performance. But what's a gap? It's when outputs or tasks requirements are not met. But then whose requirements? Stakeholder requirements. Some stakeholders care only about the outputs, and they don't care about your process. Other stakeholders care about the process, but not about your outputs, and some care about both. What do I mean when I say stakeholders? Well, here's three example models, and of course, your real world could be different from them. This one starts off with, well, the owners and shareholders were all working for them. They are the top of the pyramid top of the hierarchy, if you will, of stakeholders. It doesn't matter what the customers want. I mean, they may lead in defining what we're going to do for them, but if the owners think that they might go broke meeting the customer requirements, they're not going to do that. So they have ultimate say. But that's just one example of this model. If you think about it, the governments in the lands where you operate are above the shareholders. They have laws, regulations, and codes that you must comply with and if you don't they'll fine you or the owners they'll or they'll throw the owners in jail and so the governments actually are higher in the hierarchy of stakeholders than the shareholders are and if your enterprise embraces social responsibility then society itself overrules the governments but perhaps only after Society has forced the governments to change the laws, regulations, and codes. Not always easy, not always doable. But you need to understand who is on top. And if there's conflicts in the requirements, who wins out? Again, requirements come from these stakeholders. And they can be both formal and informal requirements. I often focus on the outputs to start all of this gap analysis versus looking at the tasks. And I ask this simple question, how do you know a good one from a bad one? When I ask master performers, how do they know a good one from a bad one? They usually give me both the formal and informal measures and sometimes standards. As a prompt, I usually share this framework unless they are well in tune with how their organization, how their enterprises measure things. Every organization, well, this is an overgeneralization, has its own set of measures. And if you're not sure, go talk to the finance people, go talk to the people in quality, etc. cetera. Uh, there is language that you should be using. You shouldn't be introducing new language. You should use the language of your enterprise when you're doing this. But quality, quantity, cost, and schedule, this is kind of standard. It goes back to the quality movement of the 1970s or 60s and even before that. Now, when I talk about quality, I'm talking about accuracy of the output, the completeness of the output, and the appropriateness. Because things can be accurate but not complete, complete but not accurate, both accurate and complete but not appropriate. So I use these simply to tease out from the master performers, their language. I don't use my language, I use theirs. But sometimes I found it necessary to stimulate the thinking and give them some initial prompts so that they could tell me, well, how are you measured? How are your outputs measured? Quality can include volume and rate and yield. And of course, combinations of these or other words. Costs can include labor costs, material costs, Overhead, or sometimes known as burden, where your capital expenditures are amortized over seven years or something, and then that's all allocated to each and every product that you produce. And the product itself, the output from a process, is carrying amount of burden or overhead within its cost structure. Again, you need to talk to your finance people to understand a little bit this better. 
And then there's also first costs versus life cycle costs. If we build training, there's a first cost to that, but if we're going to maintain it over its life cycle and update it every year because it's volatile that way, then there are certain life cycle costs that we need to acknowledge, at least in my view. Schedule or time can include touch time, how long will guys spend doing something, cycle time, how long do we give him to, in which to accomplish all of that, or is it a deadline? Have it done by Friday, 5 o'clock. We don't care how long it takes you. We don't care how long ago you started. We don't care. Deadline is the most important and only criteria regarding schedule. So sometimes it's all three. In my experiences, processes or task performance, if you need to look at that, really it comes from these two general sources. There's policies and procedure requirements internally imposed at your enterprise level. And sometimes those reflect the regulatory requirements, I mean they should, or they go beyond the regulations and are just internal. So there's external and internal requirements to be met, um, and you need to be cognizant of that because if you're going to look at processes, uh, that's the, where most of those are going to come from. Um, safety practices is an example. It could be something that the regulations require, or we've gone above and beyond that with our own policy and procedure requirements. Again, master performers know these things. Don't try to understand it all at a nuanced level. Learn to leverage master performers. Again, when an output or task requirements are not met, that's when we have a gap. And requirements come from stakeholders. So let's do a demo now to get you ready for your optional application exercise. Again, I use the performance model on the left hand side to capture ideal performance, not blue sky ideal performance, but things that master performers are already accomplishing. And what we're trying to understand here is what about those non-master performers? What are the issues here? And I ask the master performers about the non-master performers and which output measures do they typically not meet. So again, I'm focused on the outputs beginning with the end in mind and what those measures are and I ask what measures do non-master performers typically miss? The answers to that question typically go into my typical performance gap column. So I'm deriving the typical gaps off of the outputs and their key measures. And next I ask about the probable causes. Now probable is a weasel word or greasy word in place of root cause. Because I don't have time often to do root cause analysis, I'm simply trying to get off the tops of the heads of the master performers that I'm leveraging. What do they believe are the probable causes? You know, why do, is there this gap? And master performers, in my experience, typically know what others are struggling with. And if they're not asked to fix that, they don't, but they know. And sometimes they keep that to themselves because that makes them different. That makes them a master performer. And why have everybody performing at a level of, of mastery? Is that to their benefit? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And we have to be careful about that. But we're asking master performers, what are these gaps and what are their probable causes? Um, and from there we take the probable cause and we can attribute that to a deficiency of the environment, a deficiency of the individual performer's knowledge and skill set, a deficiency of the performer's individual attributes and values. Perhaps a guy can't load 75 pound bags of product onto a truck all day long. He doesn't have the physical stamina for that. Or psychologically, I'm not uh, predisposed to being able to do a sales job where I'm going to take 27 rejections in a row on average before I make a sale. Or intellectually, I'm not capable of doing both concrete thinking and conceptual thinking. Maybe you can't ask me to do strategic planning because my head just doesn't work that way. Or perhaps some of my personal values would get in the way of my performing. And those are selection issues, not training issues. So we need to do, we may need to work outside of the training realm and go fix the selection system to bring in better people people more conducive to the requirements of the processes that they're going to work in. And that's the goal, is to avoid trying to do training when training isn't going to solve anything. So here are your optional readings, including one of them 
from part one, which was my 1999 Lean ISD book, which is available as a free PDF, and a new option from my 1995 article on stakeholders. Your optional application exercises includes you now revisiting your output from the first part of this and taking a look at the measures that you captured and rethinking those now that you have a stakeholder hierarchy to think about. And you don't have to create a stakeholder hierarchy, although you might want to do that, but really the goal is to really look at, do I have all the appropriate measures captured? That's the goal. Let's wrap part two here, where our focus was on how to do a gap analysis against the ideal performance that we captured in part one. Conducting a gap analysis will logically lead to deriving the enablers that narrowly contribute to the gaps or more broadly looking at all of the enabler, enablers that enable performance. Those all come from the context, which we'll begin to cover in part three. Hope to see you there. I'm Guy Wallace and welcome to part three of my session, Performance, Competence, and Context Analysis at the Learning and Development Conference for 2020. Part three is going to focus on systematically deriving the enablers of performance, either narrowly looking at those that align to the gaps that we've identified and the probable root causes, or looking at all of the enablers. Again, your needs may differ. It could be broad or narrow. Again, the big picture of performance competence and the performance context. Performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And that is either enabled or not by the environmental and human enablers in the context. My focus since entering the field in 1979 has always been about performance and not just training, instruction, or learning. My model is focused on my definition of performance competence on the left and my adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram on the right. Let's take a closer look at all of these enablers. Once we are confident that the process itself is capable of producing outputs to stakeholder requirements, which master performers, if they're able to do it, then that means the enablers are there. So when non-master performers aren't able to perform to that ideal level of performance, that real level of performance of master performers, there's something else at play. Now, my philosophy about this is that master performers know what the barriers to performance are. They know how to avoid those barriers in the first place. And if those barriers are unavoidable, they know what to do about it to recover. So those things exist within the environmental assets that enable or the human assets that enable. As this program is being provided in a learning and development conference, I'm going to narrowly look at just awareness, knowledge, and skills as I go through my example. But be aware, there's much more to performance than awareness, knowledge, and skills. I use this format again for both capturing the data and reporting it out once completed. Just like the performance model, these enabler matrices are used by me in a facilitated group process with master performers to elicit and capture the enabling data, the enabling items. And then we link those back to the performance that it enables. Now for awareness, knowledge, and skill, I use these 17 categories of knowledge and skills to systematically derive what they are. Definitions and examples for these may be found in the optional readings that I'm providing to you at the end of this segment. Here's a completed example of an enabler matrices for knowledge and skills. We link each of the enabler items back to the area performance, to the outputs and task sets within that area performance. Now let me explain the process to you. I start off with one category at a time 
and I systematically look at the performance model chart and ask what company policies and procedures must you comply with when you're doing this area of performance? Letter A. And I list those and I check off where they link back and then I ask for the next area of performance, item B, what are the, no what are the knowledge and skill items that one must comply with, etc. And if you're familiar with the scatter diagram, I should see a scatter diagram in these columns underneath the red circle where there's more on the left and at the top and then eventually it slides to the right hand side of that set of columns and I populate more there because I'm eventually going to get to those later areas of performance and but sometimes something that is uh, needed in the later areas of performance is also needed earlier and depending on how fast you're trying to go with your group um, they may or may not be able to get that. Here are the seven areas of performance that I was using for that example here and you can look at those. We also gather this other data to later inform our instructional design efforts. Now if I were looking at enablers that weren't knowledge and skills and looking at physical attributes or data and information requirements from the environment, the, the headers on these columns would change a little bit. But uh, again, here in this, we're focused on knowledge and skills. I've got other things that I've written over the years that talk about uh, some of these charts, and you can find examples of those or ask me about those offline, and I'll be happy to share those with you. Let's wrap here part three, where our focus was identifying the enablers of performance, perhaps just those that were related to the gaps that we uncovered, or possibly to look at all of the enablers to enable all of the performance within whatever scope we're looking at. As always, it depends. Here are your optional readings, and the details for these may be found in the session handout. Your optional application exercises includes completing three enabler matrices based on your application exercise outputs from part one and part two. And note, this will all be used in part four. Let's wrap part three, where our focus was on how to derive the performance enablers. Deriving the enablers will logically lead to targeting improvement efforts, which we'll cover in part four. Hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Guy Wallace and welcome to part four, the final segment of my session, Performance Competence and Context Analysis at the Learning and Development Conference for 2020. Part four will focus on how to target potential improvement efforts. Performance happens in a context of enablers that are either adequate to the need or not. Improvement is about addressing those gaps in the enablers. It's not all about learning. It is all about performance. And I say that as somebody who has been an ISD consultant since 1982. And 95% of my work has been in the instructional design area, either developing standalone job aids, job aids embedded in training, or training when I need memorization or honing specific skill sets. Go for performance. It's not all about learning. One of my responsibilities as an ISD consultant was to help my clients see when instruction or training or learning won't solve their performance problems. Now I have a quote that I like, and that is, training requests for new hires should be expected. Training requests for problem solving should be suspected. What we know about performance is that knowledge and skills is often not the, at the root of an issue of performance or process or workflow. Most of the time it's something else. Deming said 94% of all problems on the workplace are due to the system and not to individual contributors, not to their performance. 
So it's not going to be about their knowledge and skills. It's not likely to be about their physical, intellectual, psychological attributes or their personal values. It's going to come from the environment itself. Or perhaps it's the process. The process has been designed poorly and it's not adequate to producing the outputs that meet stakeholder requirements. However, if master performers can do it, why not everybody else? So there's something to that and that's what we're trying to uncover. Again, we start with a gap from the performance models and we look first at the process and then any further investigation would inspect the enablers at the probable route and again, per the late Gary Rumler, we would start with the environment. We're going to give the performer the benefit of the doubt and if we listen to Deming, we would also do this that way as well. But once we've identified, well, what's at gap in the enablers, then we need to look upstream at what I call the provisioning systems of those enablers. Uh, environmental asset management systems that provide physical, tangible enablers to the process for the most part. And then there are systems within the enterprise that deal with human assets and deal with the selection and recruiting and the compensation, even the job design. So there's things that are more human in nature and we may need to address those. Is our training adequate? Are the consequence and culture that we've put in place adequate? So those are two different ends of this and we need to look at those to see where are we going to make the fixes because you don't make the fixes about poor data at the, at the process you're looking at, the data comes from someplace. So what is provisioning the data? What's provisioning the materials and supplies, the tools and equipment, the facilities and grounds, the financials and headcount that you're given, and the culture and consequence? The late Gary Rumler, as I've said, taught me to look at the environmental enablers first. Actually, he taught me to look at the process first and then the environment before we started looking at the performers and trying to pin the blame on them. We give them the benefit of the doubt, and Deming was aligned with that as well. A few of the interventions that one might look at to resolve issues with the environmental asset management systems are these that are listed here, but these are just a few of the many examples, and these have changed over the decades that I've been in the business, and so somebody's always coming up with some silver bullet uh, that will solve all the problems, and of course, they usually won't. But if the gap seems to be rooted in the human assets, we're going to want to look upstream at their provisioning systems. Perhaps we've got the jobs designed poorly, or we're doing recruiting and selection, or our staffing and succession planning systems are a whack, or our compensation isn't adequate, or our training isn't inadequate, or we're simply not giving the rewards and recognition that people need and desire, or it's something else combination of things. A few of the interventions that one might look at to resolve issues with the human asset management systems are listed here. And again, these change constantly. If the gap is caused by a missing or inadequate set of inputs uh, where we can't adhere to the process requirements for worthy outputs, then the gap is going to have to be addressed at one or more of these provisioning systems. And again, you've always got to keep in mind, is the process itself capable? Either master performers are following the process or they've amended the process, fixed the process so that it will work. And they need to take a look at that and look at what you're informing others as to what the process is. Maybe master performers have found a shortcut or a better practice that they're using despite what the enterprise has provided as process guidance. Here are some optional readings that you might look at. One was suggested previously and one of them is brand new. And here's your optional application exercise to target an improvement. And I'd like you to reflect on this four-part session as well so that you can generate some questions that you might be seeking answers from me or others who are going through this session as well. But wait, there's more. So if this approach appeals to you, I'm going to suggest that you begin to build your skills with some additional APOs, application exercises. Start looking at other jobs that you've had, other jobs of family and friends, 
um, and try to keep it simple at first and then increase the complexity. Um, and, you know, practice makes perfect. And when you're doing that in the future, if you need to uh, have some of your questions answered, seek some guidance, seek some feedback, please share that with me and I'll be happy to help you build your skills in this area. Performance competence is enabled by one, the process, two, the environmental enablers, and three, the human enablers. I hope you'll do the optional readings as I've merely scratched the surface in this session, as that old saying goes. And I hope you've done the application exercises as well. And we'll have some questions for my answers in the debriefing sessions as they are scheduled. I hope to see you in the debriefings. Good luck. Cheers.